And it looks like uh, it's seven. That is my clock says it's seven. Let's go to the presentation. And I also see our first speaker has arrived. So, woo! Welcome, Kuhn. All right. <coughs> you guys, you got me scared there for a second. Anyway, welcome to PHP Benlux. Uh, how's uh, the sound going? Everything okay? Okay, awesome. Um, so the schedule for today, it's going to be interesting, especially because uh, Kuhn now has additional, uh, had had uh, additional time uh, to prepare this uh, presentation, scaling WordPress on Kubernetes. Um, I think that uh, with WordPress uh, representing 40% uh, of the internet, this is going to be a very, very exciting uh, uh, session, and I'm uh, looking forward to, to see this uh, um, and hope to learn a lot from Kuhn. Um, of course, uh, around uh, 8, uh, we will have a speaker change and a break. And then at uh, 8.15, Alan uh, Schlesser will be talking about package design principles. For those of you who haven't heard of Alan, uh, he's uh, the, the main force behind uh, WP uh, CLI. Um, and I've met him a couple of times, a uh, brilliant guy. And I'm very curious uh, to learn from him uh, in regards to uh, having uh, good principles in, in developing uh, my packages. Um, of course, we have a closing note and a raffle. Um, and then we will uh, continue with an open discussion uh, during our breakout sessions. Uh, for those of you who are new to uh, uh, the meetup, welcome. Um, we're PHP Benelux. Uh, PHP Benelux, uh, we're basically like the umbrella organization for all the user groups in Belgium, Netherlands, and Luxembourg. Um, there are plenty of them. Um, in normal circumstances, you had uh, monthly meetups, but uh, unfortunately the pandemic uh, changed all that. So what we're doing now is uh, in regards to uh, supporting uh, all the local uh, user groups in uh, the Benelux and hope that we can soon have our monthly get togethers in person so we can enjoy uh, yeah, the company, the talks, the discussions and so on. As I mentioned, two speakers. So thank you, Kuhn. Uh, thank you, Alan. Uh, Alan uh, mentioned he will be a little bit later. So uh, I'm looking forward to, to see uh, him arrive uh, halfway through uh, Kuhn's uh, talk. Um, uh, again, uh, two uh, incredible speakers. And I'm very eager to learn from them. Of course, this whole session was not able to be presented uh, to you if it wasn't for our sponsors. So thank you, Spasi. Thank you, Intracto. I see Tom in the audience, so thank you, Tom. Um, you're making a, a huge difference here. And uh, into IT for uh, providing the logistics for uh, the prices. And what kind of prices do we have? Well, of course, we have elephants. Yes, we have elephants. But we also have infinity elephants. So go PHP 8. These are for you if you stay, uh, stay around and participate in the raffle. Um, a huge applause also for into IT for providing the logistics. Uh, for those of you who were here the previous episodes and were uh, waiting for the prices, there is a little delay in uh, transportation. And that's uh, because of lack of time and uh, other things. Uh, but we have your uh, contact details. We will reach out and we will make sure that you get your packages this weekend. All right. So with no further ado, I want to invite our next speaker, uh, Kuhn, to uh, the stage. And 
Let me see if I get this correctly. I will make him a presenter. And Kun, you should see all kinds of red dots uh, underneath uh, a black screen. And if you press the video and microphone, you should be able to make yourself available for the audience. This is always a very exciting moment because this is a new platform for a lot of uh, speakers. So let's make this happen. So does hey, this work? Dancing. Yes. OK. A lot hey. of things to do. It's I'm uh, I'm a bit warped. Is that me? Yes. A little bit. Okay. It, it looks like now. Now I see some streaming. Let me see if I can. Uh... Well, it's okay. Now it's okay. Ah, is it okay? It's perfect. Okay. All right. Um. Uh, this is, is my uh, is my sound okay? Your sound is perfect. All right. Great. This is what we'll do, uh, Kun. Um, you will give your presentation. I will collect all the questions, and at the end of your presentation, we will have a Q&A. And with the Q&A, we also uh, display the question on screen, so everyone can follow along uh, while you can answer these questions. Is that OK for you? Yeah, it's great. Just trying to figure out how to uh, share my screen, but I think I can I spot it now. OK. <laughs> you have a third button with, uh, yeah. that's now it's all there. Can I? Uh, I'm sharing it now. Is that OK? Yep, I see it. OK. Um, what I will Great. do is I will remove myself from the screen so you have all the visibility. And uh, I would say take it away. OK, thank you. Good luck. Thanks. OK, hey, guys. Um, thanks so much for having me tonight. Um, it's a big honor to uh, to to be a speaker here at uh, PHP Benelux. Uh, it's been a been uh, <laughs> it's been a hell of a few years, and uh, I I I it's it's so sad that we can't be there for the real life meetups. But uh, um, during the uh, because but within the last few year you in the last few months I've. Uh, I've come to like um, the online events a bit more, so that's one thing. But I'll I'll be happy if it's all over again. Um, so, um, big title, uh, big talk. Uh, while I was while I was pre preparing the slides, um, I came to realize it was quite a lot of information, uh, especially if uh, if we see. Um, if you're talking about uh, scaling WordPress, uh, it's a big topic, uh, or scaling PHP applications uh, in in general. Um, and Kubernetes, that's that's a whole other <laughs> that's 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 a whole whole other topic that uh, probably is not always necessary. But um, nevertheless, um, I removed a lot of my slides, uh, and I'll try to keep it. Um, I'll try to keep the talk as uh, as short as possible. So uh, I can give a, a small uh, demo of, uh, of an environment I set up uh, with some uh, performance and scalability best practices um, with uh, a WordPress uh, WooCommerce website. So let's start. First of all, I'm uh, I'm Koen van der Weingert. I, um, I, I have my own, my own company where I offer uh, advice and consultancy uh, to companies and uh, and, and teams in general, uh, and sometimes I also uh, um, give. Uh, I, I sometimes also uh, do projects for people. So uh, I do a lot of things. Um, but uh, one thing uh, has always um, been very dear to me, and that's performance. Um, I've always been uh, looking uh, looking at things and, and applications to uh, and to to better understand them, how they are, how they work, um, how they work in every different layer of the system, uh, and 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 how we can make them uh, even more performance. Um, 
of course, uh, if, you, if you see it in that optics, um, WordPress is quite the challenge sometimes to get uh, to get right, to get fast, um, and yeah, or not to have it hacked, for example. So uh, yeah, let's start off with my first slide, and that's uh, the big sad truth. You probably don't need to scale um, if you uh, if if especially if you're looking at something like a cloud native environment like a Kubernetes setup. Um, it's uh, it's a whole other world. Uh, it's a lot of concepts to to get to know. Um, you need uh, if you if you have a, if you have a company, you need someone on your team to uh, to yeah to be able to uh, to to get it all um, and to 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 be there when things might go wrong. Because uh, it's definitely not um, not uh, <laughs> it's it's definitely not the ultimate solution to every scalability issue. Um, so. Um, the what the most basic things you have to look forward to, uh, you have to, you have to think about um, are yeah getting make, making sure that your your application um, scales uh, no that <laughs> you have to make sure that your application um, is performant from the moment uh, you build it uh, and that it it doesn't have to scale for example so you have to you have to always think about uh, in. in in, in the best scenario, you're you're always thinking about getting the basic first, the basics right first. Um, so you start with a performance first mindset. Um, that's uh, that's more or less just uh, <laughs> doing and making every decision you, and 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 weighing every decision you you take um, in uh, from the perspective of uh, of performance. So you treat performance as a first class citizen of um, of. Uh, of your application and of the the, the success uh, performance indicators, um, but we all know that performance is not always something that's on mind of business, or that's something, uh, or or or, so, or that's something that's that's necessary in the beginning. Because in the beginning, um, you most of all um, have, uh, yeah. It's it's when you have a small application or when you have a small website uh, with not a lot of content uh, or whatever a, a database that has a few a few hundred or a few thousand records. Um, it all runs pretty smooth, but uh, as soon as your visitor counts start start filling up or your database is filling and it's not very optimized, yeah, it's 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 easy to uh, to get the basics wrong and uh, and and um, it's one of the 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 worst things you can do. Uh, on optimizing performance uh, coming in afterwards and trying to figure out uh, what went wrong somewhere uh, and, and how to fix uh, yeah, slow performing applications. So yeah, um, the first thing you're, you, you always should do is, is, is try to make it uh, run as smooth as possible without, your, without doing anything uh, that's, that's, um, that's in terms of scaling or, uh, or or making your 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 um, your your environment more performant. Um, first of all, you have to make sure that your application in itself um, is as good as as good as it's gonna get. So you have to um, uh, ideally, if you have some tests running, you have some integration tests running. Um, you 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 have some. Uh, you also add some performance tests that um, that yeah that measure and uh, measure and, and and link performance regressions during the the development phase of your application so you can find bottlenecks early on um one of those bottlenecks uh, for example are uh, are uh, classic classic ones are, are all external resources that uh, your application have to have to, has to wait uh, on like databases apis um because they have to set up connection or um, in the case of WordPress, you can have a, uh, you can quickly build up uh, a website with a big web a big web shop, WooCommerce, a lot of products in it. Um, maybe have it multilingual too, uh, and and that means uh, your database is, is is filled with a, a crap ton of shit, uh, to say it uh, in neat terms. Um, so the number of queries needed to just render uh, the, the home page, for example, is is yeah, um, yeah, it's it's. To, to cry about. Um, so uh, the environment your application runs in is also something that plays a big role. Um, for example, if you're running on, on, on some cheap web hosting, shared hosting, you can have, uh, 
you you can sometimes have bad performance just because there's there's some bad neighbors that that just hog up all the resources of the server your application is running on and there's not much you can do so um things like that mm. But that's not really a, <laughs> a small introduction. So things you have to keep in mind um, to uh, when, you, when you think about uh, bottlenecks for performance. So it's uh, so it's those external API, uh, exter external resources. It's the environment your, your application is running on. It's um, the network. Uh, it's 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 the the, the quality uh, of your uh, your network connection and uh, the amount of visitors and traffic it gets. Um, disk I.O. is always slow. So um, if you don't have something like an in-memory object cache uh, and your application has to load uh, a lot of files from the disk every time uh, every time a user uh, visits your website, um, that, that, that can turn things uh, bad in, a, in, in, in an instant. Um, yeah. Especially if there's uh, there's there's someone who, uh, who who found a plugin to uh, to to optimize the performance of a WordPress website, um, and uh, he saw something that was uh, was called object caching, and he and it, and he thought, oh, that's nice. Um, so how can I cache the objects? Yeah, I, I'll cache them on disk, um, so uh, I don't have to uh, worry about those pesky database connections. Yeah. That's not really good if you're if you have a slow if you have slow disk IO. There's a lot of uh, there's a lot of web hosting providers nowadays that don't even uh, provide real um, real uh, bare metal servers uh, or, or, or a direct connection between the the the, the disk and, and 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 the server itself. So most of the times um, the your your storage files your files in storage is just uh, on a cluster somewhere. So there's also um, a bit more latency between every read you do from from disk, so that's something else uh, you need to worry about. Um, so there's also uh, a couple of slow and uh, compute heavy tasks that can hold up everything, um, like slow database queries that's for reportings uh, and stuff. Um, external API requests that are slow, uh, yeah. In an essence, don't have <laughs> things that are slow that you can uh, you can. Um, Find those bottlenecks by using things like profilers, like xdebug or xh pre, xhprof, or maybe even uh, even an external service like uh, New Relic and Blackfire. So, if you don't, uh, if if your website still is not not uh, fast enough, <laughs> there is a couple of things you can do to scale. Um, not uh, you don't have to scale. Uh, on the cloud environments, uh, just yet you can just uh, you can do something like uh, vertically scaling or horizontally scaling. Um, and and horizont if you think about vertical scaling, um, you can uh, you can think of it quite literally as just uh, um, those those old, those old mill those old mainframe computers uh, that uh, that are still in service of some companies. Um, you just have to. Uh, Rack in some more, uh, some more resources, some more CPU, and some more, uh, some more memory, and hope that it will, uh, it'll, it will turn out all right. That's a bit, that's like vertical scaling, but uh, horizontal scaling is, um, is more uh, scaling your se your application by separating out your um, the, the the components of it, um, and 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 even maybe even hosting them on, on multiple instances or m multiple servers, and then you still you still just have one. Uh, one component, like uh, most of the time, you have um, you have an application server, um, you have a database server, a web server, uh, maybe even content delivery network or or media server. Um, or if you're really good, you you might just have an, uh, a search service, uh, like something like an Elasticsearch or an Apache Solar or something. Um, yeah, all those things can be split apart in uh, in 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 their own components or their own servers. Um, so that's uh, that's what that, that was that's what's what happened uh, mostly in the past. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's 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 uh, quite a good uh, a good way to tackle things. But there's also other things. Um, you could just also go all in and go for a horizontally scalable and highly available elastic. Elastic architecture. So, what's that? <laughs> so, uh, 
So if you're talking about high availability, uh, high availability just means uh, it's a term that's 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 uh, that gets uh, intertwined with with things like performance uh, or just um, or auto scaling or, st or, th or something. But high availability is just that um, when one part of your application goes down, not everything goes down. So you most likely have multiple instances of your application um, running separately. Um, that's like uh, in in in, in the most extreme circumstances, it's like a failover data center you have um, for, for, for banks that are required to do things like that. Um, but in, in the smallest way, it's just um, two separate uh, servers that, uh, that, can, uh, that can handle your, your, your traffic simultaneously. So that means you don't have a single point of failure. Um, so uh, you can also um, have uh, all of those different parts of your application uh, high, in high availability modes. Um, so, uh, for example, you can have multiple uh, multiple web servers that are uh, being load balanced by uh, a specialized load balancer. Um, so they can uh, they can they can balance the traffic between the one server and the other server. Um, you can also have an, uh, a database cluster that can uh, that can balance the loads and that can even uh, Work in an, uh, a master and a replica uh, variant where you can uh, maybe use all the replicas uh, to just do the read operations uh, because the reads on a database are always a lot faster than uh, than writes and they don't invalidate a lot of read caches. So um, there's uh, that's one setup to do it. You could also uh, go for an elastic architecture, um, and then we're going a bit more to the to the cloud and the scalability. Uh, topic um, of scaling things. Uh, elastic architecture is when your application itself can scale uh, with traffic and demand. So um, yeah, there's, it's, it's, uh, it's nice if you have uh, an application that can run in mul multiple instances. Um, and when, uh, when you anticipate a lot of traffic or when you have some automatic automated software running that's uh, that's analyzing the traffic or the state of your your application. Um, it can automatically uh, decide to scale it up or scale down depending on uh, on how uh, how good you're doing or bad you're doing on, uh, based on traffic. Uh, so, um, for example, there's an, uh, an example set setup for uh, for a typical PHP application. So you have. Uh, on the one hand, you have the browsing public, um, so that's all the visitors uh, and maybe even uh, also the administrators who have, need to have access to the content management system or the backend of the application. Uh, most of the time, uh, most of the times, it's 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 um, load balanced uh, by a reverse proxy, and a reverse proxy is uh, is uh, something like a varnish uh, a varnish server or even uh, Cloudflare. Uh, the free version of Cloudflare is just it's just as good as it's, it's almost just as good as a reverse proxy as varnish if you know how to use it um so it's uh, it's something that sits between your uh your web servers uh and, and and the internet they try to uh um they try to offload uh your application as much as possible based on requests because if you want to scale uh you probably know that your application is not that good at handling a lot of traffic um, so you don't want to uh, you don't want to bother your application um, that much. So if there's websites, web pages, uh, for example, or uh, uh, REST API um, responses that are uh, that are cacheable, um, like all GET requests should be cacheable, for example, um, then you it makes sense to have a reverse proxy uh, cache those requests and send them back to the and send them to the to the user. So uh, if someone else then uh, sends the same. Uh, the same request that's untainted and uh, just needs to have the same result. Uh, the reverse proxy can just uh, show a cached version instead, and that that's that's way better for your uh, your application. So it can focus on the hard stuff. Uh, most of the time, uh, when your application has to search for stuff in uh, in in a database that is not that good optimized or is, that is that is quite big, um, it's uh, it. It pays off to uh, to have a search engine or a search indexing service um, to uh, that that indexes your the, the searchable parts of your database um, and arranges them in a way that uh, 
make sense for handling search queries. So one of the one of the largest or or best examples uh, is Elasticsearch. Um, there's also the uh, Apache Solar, um, and there's a lot of uh, there's also some uh, some hosted uh, software as a service uh, things like uh, that that can uh, that can offer these services for you. Um, one of the most uh, known, I think, is Aholia. They uh, they they got quite known uh, when they uh, when they decided to uh, to give um, to give nonprofit free access. <laughs> so um, there's also um, there's also the matter of uh, of sharing the same file system. Uh, if you have an application that is quite intensive or has to write stuff to uh, to the file system. Uh, or has to work with with files in some other way. Um, that's a big issue for uh, for scalable applications. Like uh, if one PHP app uh, stores some uploaded content uh, to its disk, um, but the other one uh, doesn't know about it. So um, and, and and the load balancer chooses the other one. Uh, it just gives a 404 because the file doesn't exist there. Um, that's that's not something you would like to do. Would like to have. Uh, there's also the matter of uh, of, of tracking uh, of tracking sessions between uh, between instances of an application. Uh, most of the times, an application uh, has its own way, or maybe by default, PHP stores its sessions um, in a session file in the temporary folder, um, also on the server. So you have to account for that, um, or else you're gonna have some issues. <laughs> um, so. That sounds like a lot of work. So we need abstraction to keep track of it all. And abstraction, I mean uh, containers, um, because containers are very good at um, at uh, abstracting away the environment and providing uh, a scalable and reproducible environment for uh, for your application to run in. Um, it provides uh, it uh, provides consistency and uh, and statelessness uh, to an application. Um, So just deciding if I'm going to show the next slide or say something next. Um, yeah, there's a, no, I said something about statelessness. Um, statelessness is something that's uh, that's a god gift uh, that came with, uh, with containers, and it should have should be one of the uh, the, mo the fundamental fundamental parts of um, of uh, of the. Uh, of software that runs nowadays, um, because statelessness means that you can just uh, you can just spin up whatever you like, uh, and it will always work. It doesn't depend on other things uh, or um, or a shared file system, for example. Um, it doesn't matter if um, I was connected to one instances of one instance of an application uh, and did some things on there, uh, and then that instance got scaled down. So um, I. I would have lost my session otherwise, for example. Uh, so um, to keep track of all of those things, uh, we need something like an orchestrator because uh, you have containers, but a, a container in itself, uh, it, it, needs, it needs to figure out what service to uh, what, what what service uh, is 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 located where and and how to reach um, the web server, for example, or how to reach the, the database. Um, so you have to provide. Uh, so we need something that can provide more information uh, on the fly to those stateless containers. Like you are this, uh, you are this container. This is something you need, and these are the other services you need to talk to. That's uh, one of the things an orchestrator does. Uh, other thing is uh, is. Uh, infrastructure management, like uh, turning uh, a lot of uh, bare metal servers into uh, or other or other hardware into just heaps of uh, of CPU and memory, uh, and even disk, uh, of course. Uh, there's lifecycle management, uh, monitoring the uh, the health of an application, uh, auto uh, scaling up, scaling down, um, killing uh, a failing application, or uh, um, it may be even uh, even stop an application from receiving uh, requests for a few minutes uh, so that it can recover uh, for from from a, a huge peak in traffic. There's also uh, yeah the auto scaling part. Um, 
there's uh, there's also the matter of running one off one off processes. One off processes are things like uh, things you, uh, you you want to do in the background, for example, a cron job or uh, maybe uh, some maybe maybe another another worker. Uh, something you don't want to run in 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 your application itself because it will slow it slow it down. So uh, the classic example is the uh, yeah it's is is um, uh, a background worker that, for example, um, uh, sends uh, sends emails uh, after a certain after a user has uh, has uh, signed up or made an order. Um, the time that your application needs needs to send the email is time uh, is is valuable time. So it's better to uh, to just put the email in the queue somewhere and have another worker um, with more resources handle that thing. Um, Configuration sharing, secret sharing, all of those things are very hard. So uh, there's not that much uh, orchestrators. There's like there's there's Docker Swarm, of course. Um, there's uh, Rancher also, but one of the most important ones or one of the most known ones is Kubernetes. And Kubernetes is awesome. Um, and it's something uh, it's that's very fun to play around with. Uh, it's a, it's another part. It's another thing to actually have uh, production, uh, have very important production stuff on Kubernetes because you have to know what you're doing. Because uh, um, sometimes things can go wrong, uh, and you need to know how to handle that. So it's uh, it's it's a portable and extensible uh, platform to uh, yeah to manage containerized workflows. Uh, so there's. Uh, I'm going to give a very quick introduction to uh, the concepts of it. Uh, first, the architecture, the containers, what are the workloads, services, load balancing, networking, storage, configuration, and namespaces. So first, we have, um, we have a bit of architecture. Um, everything. Uh, it's it's not just the cloud; it's always someone else's computer, right? Um, so it all starts with uh, with 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 nodes, and nodes are um, are just WordPress. Uh, are just uh, are just yeah. Most likely, they're they're some sort of server, maybe virtualized, uh, but mostly uh, mostly dedicated server, um, or 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 something you uh, or or yeah, an Elastic Cloud uh, instance or or. or uh, yeah, <laughs> whatever. Just a server, and the server um, runs a bit of software on it, um, like a kubelet. Um, it, it also runs a container runtime and uh, and kube proxy. Um, nodes are what uh, are the abstraction of a server, um, and uh, they uh, communicate with some sort of a control plane uh, that has an API and a scheduler. Um, and some configuration database and all of those fancy things um, to make it all run smooth and to also to uh, to synchronize the cluster to uh, to to recover if uh, a node fails uh, or to to reschedule things on other nodes. Um, so if you have uh, so you have the server, uh, well we need to run things on the server and that's what you can do in pods in Kubernetes. Uh, pod is just a, a uh, a collection of one or more um, related containers uh, that share some sort of uh, yeah that share some sort of some sort of configuration or file system or things like that. Uh, you have container images, uh, of course, that are being run by the container runtimes. Uh, the the biggest known ones are Docker and Container D, uh, of course. Mm. Um, if you're um, a big part of the Kubernetes concepts is the workloads. Um, so I was talking about the pods. So the pods are uh, are just it's just a collection of running of of uh, a part of one application or part of the application. Um, it's uh, it's yeah, it's an instance of uh, of an application. Uh, and um, most of the times, uh, you don't want to uh, to manage each and every pod because you want some auto scalable architecture, or you want uh, or you want it to be highly available. So you want uh, you want a pod to be uh, you want you want your application to be uh, um, uh, to be there on every server of uh, on every node of your cluster. So you would like uh, to have something that manages those things for you. That also can can kill the pods or restart the pods or 
um, or update them if you have uh, updated your application. So that's where workloads come in. Um, and the most uh, basic one is a deployment. Uh, just says, um, OK, uh, I have a deployment here. Uh, I have two pods. It's a database pod. It's an application server pod. Um, they both. Uh, they don't share that much uh, storage, but uh, they have uh, access to the same secret information about the database connection, for example. Uh, yeah, um, there's also a replica set that says, okay, we can have uh, we can have uh, at least three replicas of this of this instance, for example. Um, things like uh, one-off jobs uh, and, and, and stuff, they run inside of cron jobs and jobs. Um, so that's, uh, they run on a schedule or they run uh, after the deployment of your application, for example. Um, we also have uh, in the concept of uh, load balancing and networking, we have services and uh, services are what abstracts all of those uh, pods with their, with their unique IP address and IP, uh, unique host name. Um, you don't want to keep track of uh, every single database pod in your web server uh, application, for example. So uh, you just want one, uh, you just want one endpoint, one one DNS endpoint uh, to contact, uh, and, and uh, you have to trust the service or Kubernetes to uh, to to handle the traffic and to uh, to automatically link you to uh, an instance of the database that is uh, healthy and uh, at, and and and. Uh, most likely of all, uh, very close uh, to uh, your pod itself. Um, yeah, it also does the load balancing. Uh, and then, of course, uh, we've only been talking about traffic internally. Um, most, uh, if you if you if you uh, if you configure Kubernetes correctly, uh, most traffic is contained inside of the cluster, and you have to open up. Uh, things from to the outside uh, using an ingress. Ingress is just uh, it can be an uh, it can be an, an, an nginx ingress or maybe a traffic pro traffic proxy or uh, H HA proxy. All of those things and they can be configured to uh, to expose certain services on certain uh, on certain uh, host names uh, or certain paths and they can be configured to uh, to do all sort of sort of nice things like automatically generate uh, an SSL certificate and stuff uh, so for storage you can also uh, you, there, there's a concept called uh, volume abstraction where you can you can you can write a claim for a certain type of uh, of volume in kubernetes um, you can uh, you can say uh, it has to be of a type uh, network file system, for example, uh, or it has to be uh, it has to be an, uh, a directory on the node, uh, or it has to be an, an, an empty directory that uh, that gets that is empty every time you start a pod, but can be shared between uh, two containers in a pod, for example. Um, there's also uh, the concept of access modes, and that's quite important if you're talking about scaling. Um, because uh, if you have uh, a volume, um, it's and and you want to share it, uh, it's it's quite hard to have uh, two instances uh, read and write to the same uh, volume. Uh, there's not that much in, there's not that much uh, ways to do that. Um, so uh, for that, you need an, a read write. Uh, Anywhere uh, the the R R W X uh, access mode, um, and that's maybe something like an NFS uh, share or uh, uh, something that's uh, that that's uh, in the background synchronizes your uh, your your files to another object store, for example, um, and and abstracts uh, and, and and is mounted as as just another disk. Um, there is also configuration management. Uh, the just normal config can be stored in config maps, uh, but there is also um, secrets that can uh, contain uh, uh, that contain secret information that's uh, encoded in base uh, sixty four. So it's not encrypted. But there's uh, there's uh, there's other things like sealed secrets uh, that can encrypt your. Uh, your your secrets, but most of the time it just uh, it's 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 credentials for an external API or maybe uh, credentials for uh, connecting to the database. Uh, in and all of those things can be uh, can be linked together inside of a namespace. Um, and yeah, 
If you if we look at an example configuration uh, of uh, a deployment, like I said before, um, if you want uh, a, a deployment of uh, of of three uh, engine X uh, pods, um, you would do it like uh, you would you would write an, a YAML file uh, and then you apply it to the um, to Kubernetes with kubectl. Uh, with the kubectl apply f deployment dot yaml. So you say I have uh, I have I have your deployment that uh, tries to adhere to the uh, version one of the API version, um, and it's a deployment. It's uh, the, its name is my nginx. Um, the labels uh, to uh, it relates to uh, is uh, is nginx the application, um, and uh, the spec is. Uh, the way to describe the pods themselves, uh, it's they have to be uh, they have to be there. There's have, there has to be three uh, three replicas, for example, um, and uh, it's it has to, it needs to have the nginx image with the port. Uh, yeah, all of those things. There's also the service to link it to, and of course, uh, there's also an ingress uh, to link the service to the outside, but to manage a cluster. There's a lot of tools uh, uh, to use it, um, and uh... so there's um, if you there there's there's command line tools you can use. Uh, there's dashboards you can use. Uh, there's also things you can use for managing a release. Um, uh, Helm, for example, that's that's like that's that's some sort of a package manager for uh, for easier uh, with with the templating of those YAML files. So you don't have to uh, we don't have to um, update those big long YAML files uh, themselves, and you just use uh, a Go templating language uh, based on some some values you provide to generate the configuration for you uh, it does also it also does some things like release management and auto and auto rolling back when things fail uh, those things uh, you also have to have a pretty good alm stack like uh, to to alert lock and monitor things um, the one of the things I like most is the Kubernetes dashboard that comes with it. Uh, it's not it's not default, but you can you can enable it. Uh, it's uh, it's a nice visual overview of what things you're you're running. Um, one of the tools I uh, use daily is Kubernetes. Uh, it's uh, it's a command line interface, uh, and most of the times most of the time a, a very fancy wrapper around kubectl. Um, it's uh, if you don't know it, it's it's amazing. Um, and it's yeah. Uh, the Helm it was the package manager for Kubernetes. It like, uh, yeah. It also has uh, as a hub. Uh, it pro they provide a lot of uh, they provide uh, Helm charts and Helm charts are uh, basically uh, industry uh, industry standard ways and and configurations uh, of how to run specific uh, kinds of software and even link them together. So. Uh, for example, an example Helm chart for a WordPress, WordPress application contains a chart file uh, with some information on what it what it exactly is, um, and you can uh, you can install and upgrade using the command line. So um, one of the most important things is that you keep track of everything um, because uh, if you don't see anything, uh, you're you don't know what's going on and uh, things are. Uh, you have a lot of traffic, and your servers are failing for for one reason, uh, and you don't have that much metrics, uh, and that sucks. So um, one of the most important things is monitoring. Uh, you know, you need to know what happens. Uh, you need to know how your caching service, how your caching is uh, is is uh, is performing compared to how much traffic there is. Um, how how long uh, a, a typical request uh, takes uh, those things. And, and that's uh, that's logging and gathering met metrics, uh, alerting, logging, monitoring. Uh, it's uh, most important for performance tuning and post mortem post mortem analysis. Um, gonna skip through this because otherwise I'm not gonna have that much time for the demo. Um, if we're looking at the uh, 
at the actual hosting WordPress on Kubernetes part. Um, I'm gonna give some. Uh, an, I'm gonna give an example setup uh, and some uh, some things that could that we have to bear in mind. Um, a very basic example setup could be that you have uh, an uh, you have some sort of ingress. So you have to, so it's 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 a guard or um, something in between that uh, that links the outside traffic to you. Uh, it can also load balance. Uh, there's a lot of fancy things uh, also available in uh, in the Google Kubernetes engine, or uh, uh, they also have they have their own uh, ingress with own load balancing and health checks and multi region region high availability all of those things. Uh, and the ingress the the ingress uh, links to the reverse caching proxy, which uh, is the first layer of defense against uh, against a lot of traffic. Um, there's the web server, there's the application server, and it uh, it's talks to the files, database, and cache. Uh, and if we put some logos next to it, uh, one of my uh, a setup or a stack that I like to use is uh, Varnish for a reverse caching proxy, Nginx as the web server, of course, PHP FPM as the application server. And uh, for files, I love to use object stores uh, as, a, as, as a backend because uh, it's it's way easier uh, to to not have to worry about uh, a plain old uh, disk or, or mounted network share to uh, to get your files to uh, to sync up properly. Um, for database, you can just go with a database or uh, maybe uh, an, uh, a performance uh, a cluster like uh, the Kona ExtraDB cluster or the uh, MariaDB Galera cluster, uh, and as object cache. Um, a way for storing uh, storing uh, data and uh, result of, of of long operations uh, or just yeah plain old objects uh, in uh, in a very fast in memory cache and Redis is uh, amazing for that. So the varnish is the uh, the reverse caching proxy. It's the first line of defense. Um, it's uh, I'd like to refer it as the uh, the German approach uh, the, with 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 blitz uh, requests. Um, its uh, its job is to get your uh, visitors as soon uh, as possible uh, in and out. Um, they, if something something is in cache, they can they can use uh, they'll 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 do it. Um, it's yeah, it's nice. So um, there is the database. You can use a managed one uh, that is optimized for you. That maybe has some DBAs running uh, running around to uh, to to set some uh, some indexes and whatnot for you. Uh, you can use a cluster, uh, or you can just use uh, a single database that's uh, that's hosted in the near vicinity of your application. That's that's most of the times uh, that's all you need because uh, if you have a lot of queries, uh, latency in terms of network is most important. Uh, the shared files uh, I like to I like to do I like to uh, build my applications in a read only in a read only container and then have the uh, the, the shared files uh, in wordpress it's the uh, the uploads uh, on an uh, on an object store so you don't have to worry about uh, about one instance uh, writing a file and the other one not having access to it um, for object stores uh, i like to use um S i like to i like to use s3 compatible things like uh, um, S3 or, uh, or or Google Cloud uh, or even uh, Minio and Rook, they are amazing. Uh, you could also uh, you could also mimic it uh, and have uh, something like uh, our clone synchronize uh, in the background and just uh, have it uh, pretend to be a plain old uh, file system. Uh, if you're looking at WordPress, uh, one of the uh, Ways I like to set it up. Uh, the, the, the best way I think is uh, is running Nginx as the uh, as a web server, um, having PHP FPM as the dedicated standalone application server to handle the PHP requests. To have Redis as an object cache and to run it inside a read-only container. Um, some things you have to worry about is uh, mining your resources you use. Uh, to uh, know when to uh, when to leave your leave an instance alone when it's it's having a lot of traffic uh, when it's becoming slow or unresponsive you have to uh, give it some time to recover or before you start killing it or before you uh, just keep on sending every traffic to that one instance 
um, that's that's some that's something bad. Uh, you have to deal with uh, sessions uh, being uh, carried over, so you can so um, it's best to uh, to store the sessions not on disk, uh, but in also in Redis object cache, um, not in the database, definitely not. Uh, you also have to prepare for peaks by uh, trying to uh, uh, warm your caches, making sure that uh, if you're uh, if you know those pesky uh, Facebook uh, query strings, they they add to advertising campaigns that are unique for every click. Uh, so your cache uh, basically gets filled uh, and, and and doesn't work as good uh, if that's used. So you have to uh, with varnish you can uh, you can you can fix that. Uh, yeah. So I'm going to give uh, uh, some plugins I used uh, as uh, the proxy cache purge plugin to uh, to actually uh, signal to the uh, to varnish or or another um, proxy cache that we have to uh, uh, we have to purge something from uh, from the uh, from the from the reverse proxy. Um, S3 upload, uploads by human made is a uh, fancy is, is is a very small plugin that just uh, is amazing at uh, at abstracting away the the, the 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 uploads file system and pushing those to uh, to Amazon S3. Uh, HyperDB is nice if you have a cluster of data uh, a database cluster and uh, you need to distinguish between a, a read uh, a read database server and a write database server. Um, it can do that for you. Query monitor is nice for having some uh, some on the fly statistics without a lot of uh, a lot of things, uh, and those other plugins like uh, WP Redis, uh, the one that's adapted by Pantheon, is very nice. Uh, there's also a way to uh, to store user sessions in uh, of WordPress, not in the database by default, uh, but in uh, in Redis uh, also. And Elastic Press is nice for uh, for integration with uh, with Elastic Search as a caching, uh, as a search indexing service. Um, I'm gonna give a small demo of uh, something. I uh, that's the wrong one. Okay, let's see. How am I doing on time? <laughs> okay, I um I set up some uh, I set up. Uh, a demo environment here on uh, on this website. Uh, it's just a it's just a WordPress uh, basic. Uh, yeah, uh, it's yeah, a it's about, a basic. Uh, Ten minutes. Ah, okay, fantastic. It's uh, yeah, it's just a basic WooCommerce store. It has uh, a few plugins. The ones I just uh, just said. Um, it has uh, it has. Um, a way to purge things from the cache. Uh, you can just uh, you can just purge all pages or just a single page. Uh, flush the object cache. All of those things. Um, but you can see if I open it in uh, in a private browsing uh, window. Um, although it has quite a lot of products inside, it's all it's 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 quite fast. Uh, it runs on a. Uh, Hmm. It runs on. Uh, it also uses Elastic Press to uh, to connect to an, an Elastic Search database. Uh, it can synchronize uh, your the content, your products, your posts um, with uh, with the Elastic Search, and then it can just offload the uh, the searching to also make sure you don't uh, you don't hog your server by. Um, by having people search random stuff or uh, having the, having them order your uh, your queries a lot of time for <laughs> some things. Uh, so if we take a look at how everything works, um, I have some uh, I have uh, the Elasticsearch as a stateful set running on Kubernetes. Um, I am running uh, my setup locally. Uh, I'm using to to run it locally. I'm running I'm using Lambdo. Uh, it's it's an amazing tool that leverages all the all of the uh, the fancy power of um, of Docker Compose uh, with a uh, a traffic uh, a traffic um, HTTP uh, proxy to uh, to to allow for uh, things like 
to have to have multiple instances of an of or multiple applications running uh, just through the same proxy. I'm using Minio as a way to uh, to store my files. It's uh, I'm not sure what the, what the what the what the things were what the uh, yeah, it's it's in uh, in my environment file. Okay. So it's just a uh, it's a nice object store. And of course, you can use the object store to uh, to put uh, um, to connect this to a cloud uh, to to a CDN to uh, to even offload those things. Um, I'm running uh, my application itself. My WordPress is uh, using the Bedrock stack. It's uh, it's one thing. It's it's uh, it's one of the few things uh, you you have to use if you want uh, proper composer support uh, and and uh, manage your uh, your your dependencies uh, in a way that's predictable um, and uh, reproducible across environments. I'm using, uh, I'm building a few of my own images for Nginx and, uh, and PHP FPM. I'm having, I have my own, uh, I have, I made a, a small, uh, I made a small Helm chart uh, and it's the way to deploy uh, the WordPress environment it comes with a few templates um, for the WordPress. Um, for example, it stores uh, files like the PHP ini file, uh, some the uh, the the engine X config file in a config map. So it can just if I if I edit it here and uh, push an up update, uh, it just uh, edits those without having to build another image of uh, of the on my on my local computer. Uh, I run WordPress. Uh, all the all the hard jobs, all the hard uh, tasks um, are running inside of a cron job. Um, so uh, the uh, WP cron is uh, is fully disabled uh, on the uh, on on the server side because you don't have to, you don't want to run uh, those uh, those those those. Uh, long and and hard jobs uh, on the uh, on the precious. Uh, network and HTTP requests. So, uh, so um, I have the schedule here. That's a that's a cron job. All it does is uh, schedule a pod that runs uh, the WP cron event run um, command. Uh, also have the same thing for action scheduler, which is an awesome uh, piece of software that's. Uh, uh, that's amazing for running background jobs, uh, not in the in the old uh, WordPress Chrome. Uh, yeah. Without the dash, uh, it also comes bundled with uh, with uh, WooCommerce nowadays, and it's a way to uh, to process things in the background in the background at scale. It can uh, it it has support for queue runners, uh, batching, um, even retrying jobs. Uh, all quite uh, the same as the uh, as the WordPress con, but better. Um, let's see what can I uh, what can I show? I also have um, in my deployments file of the WordPress uh, environment. Um, I uh, I have this uh, the config map checksum that uh, does it there's a checksum on the checksum on the config map uh, so it reloads when some config has changed. Um, I have some probes that uh, that that check whether everything is still working and if not if uh, if things are going slow, um, they will be marked as uh, as not ready so the, um, the 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 instances can scale up and uh, and yeah. Boy, I had to prepare this better. <laughs> uh, some other things uh, that's nice is you can uh, use affinity rules to uh, to determine to say like uh, if I schedule a WordPress instance, I want it next to uh, I want I want to have a Redis instance next to it, for example, uh, and I 
I would I, I don't want it to be scheduled uh, alongside another WordPress instance. So we're just competing for resources. Um, there's also the uh, the horizontal pod auto scaler. Uh, right now um, it's enabled, and I want a minimum of two replicas and a maximum of six replicas. And the metrics are uh, and the most one of the most one of the easiest things is to just base it on uh, on resource metrics like average CPU utilization, average memory utilization. So if it's uh, if it goes above that, uh, it will scale up. Uh, it's it's quite fast. Uh, if I see the deployments, if I uh, if I manually scale up to like uh, like four replicas, let's see, they uh, they almost start to run instantly. It's just an nginx and it's a PHP pod, and after thirty seconds or so, oh, it's it's all. I now have uh, four instances of uh, of it running. For the varnish part, I'm using uh, that's the last thing I'm gonna say because it's quite nifty. I'm not using a varnish, uh, a, a basic varnish um, setup, but I'm using a, uh, I'm using Cube HTTP cache, and it's a varnish operator. It's a modern version of uh, of running varnish on Kubernetes, uh, and it's uh, it basically keeps track of uh, of all of your your pods, and uh, yes, the, uh, the the source files will be will be made available. Uh, Alain, sorry. Um, the cube HTTP cache it's cool because um, it's a way of uh, of having multiple uh, even multiple instances of varnish running uh, and have they have them share their 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 cache storage by by sharding the information um, and they have uh, an automatically updating uh, configuration file that uh, that lists all backends uh, and that updates them as soon as one of your uh, your application becomes uh, as soon as one of your deployment starts to scale so uh, the uh, the varnish was instantly reloaded as soon as these uh, applications became hot and uh, it's uh, it's just you can you can you can just uh, you can run this uh, this nifty little tool made by uh, a very cool person uh, that does a lot of uh, fancy stuff on uh, on WordPress yeah maybe there's time for a few questions, uh, perhaps I was going a bit uh, chaotic uh, because I had to had to pick a lot of things. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, no worries, no worries. Um, okay, I will uh, enable Q and A. So uh, okay, I will take how do I do that? Screen. And um, uh, this was a uh, question, and uh, this was a question. So let me go to the Q&A OK, mode. let's see. What do you recommend to yourself for self-hosting free variants of things like? Um, well, there's, uh, so hey, Jelber. I think I, uh, I, I know you from, uh, from, um, from PHP, Hope, um, back in the time. Um, what I would recommend for self-hosting free variants of things like Ang Algolia. Um, well, actually, if you're working with um, with WordPress or even Drupal, um, there's there's pretty good uh, out of the box support for things uh, for for Elasticsearch. Um, there, there's a few things they did with uh, with with licensing, but it's 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 a different story. Um, but Elasticsearch is is one of the most tried and true uh, ways of uh, of easily um, offloading your. Uh, um, your indexable content to a search engine so i would uh, i would definitely recommend it um there's also apache solar um that's uh, that's 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 also uh, quite uh, quite a nice tool uh, or, or quite a nice service but it's it requires a bit more uh, configuration work um, it has a lot of aspects you can tweak um as well as uh, um, elastic search but it's it's a bit more uh, it's a bit more die hard uh, let's say um, uh, yeah. So and Solar is also uh, yeah, XML based, so yeah, you know, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, very very good. Yeah, of course, support for those, for both of those things is is quite good. Uh, I think Pantheon, uh, the 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 big host, the 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 scalable hosting provider that's uh, that's doing some things with uh, with cloud uh, and 
uh, right now they have uh, they also have the the new version of the WP Redis plugin, and um, they uh, they did a lot of work of on on integrating Solar uh, into Drupal and also WordPress, I think, because they run it on their servers. Um, so it's it's um, it's quite configurable without having to know a bit a lot about Solar itself. So it's also good. Okay. Let's see. Um, okay, I uh, saw the question before. Will the source files be made available? Yeah, I will. Uh, I'll, I'll polish them a bit and I'll I'll put them on uh, on GitHub somewhere. Definitely. Um, there's um, a few of those things. Um, I uh, there's I, I I took or I I took some inspiration for uh, how uh, the Wunder agency, uh, the 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 European Wunder agency is is doing their Drupal deployments nowadays. Um, they have this really fancy setup with like a whole cluster that um, that you can uh, you can uh, automatically based on the current branch you're working on you can spin up a new instance of your application uh, have have a, have a, have an ingress spin up with uh, with a dedicated um, a dedicated domain name for the feature request you're uh, or the pull request you're doing uh, and have that instance also. Uh, use reference data that was made available through uh, uh, a daily backup uh, of the, the the life or the, uh, the the staging environment so um it's the yeah size <laughs> can you show the kubernetes management under the php storm services tab um no i don't use it <laughs> i'm uh, I, I i don't i don't use that um but maybe if you can uh what, what, what would you like to see? Because uh, I mean, uh, my, my screen is not, uh, I'm not, not sharing it anymore, but. Um, well, you can always uh, rescreen. Uh, yeah, okay, but. So, what's the, uh, what, what would like, what would you like to see about uh, the uh, Kubernetes management? He's uh, typing. Question was kind of mean, but it's setup is easy, so I got my team on board in just a few minutes. Oh yeah, it's probably the uh, Kubernetes management that you can set up for 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 your teams as a configuration. Hmm, I have a third of it, so never mind. <laughs> yeah, no hard feelings. <laughs> Well, at least uh, it was a uh, an amazing talk. Uh, I mean, um, yeah, I, I I had a feeling that I I went I was a bit it was a bit chaotic. So um, there's a lot of things to say and not a lot of time. And uh, I was constantly thinking like, yeah, uh, if I say that, I have to give some information about that. And then yeah, I tripped yeah. off my own words and stuff. But I can I'm 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 surely available in the. Uh, in, in the breakout sessions, if you would like to ask me some questions afterwards. Oh, that would so, be awesome. I, I, I yeah. think that uh, the breakout session will be uh, uh, open for all and, 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 and people can have uh, discussions with you about it. So, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. No problem. Okay, uh, Kun, um, I'm going to uh, make you an attendee at this point. Um, and then I will uh, announce uh, a short break. Uh, I see people applauding in uh, the chat, so uh, you probably will get uh, more applause. Uh, so uh, thank you, Kun. Uh, awesome. I took a lot of notes, and I probably have to review uh, the 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 recordings again uh, to to uh, pick out uh, the things I missed. Yeah, because uh, there was a lot of uh, info. Yeah, and I, I left out quite a bit. So, but, uh, oh, okay. I, so, so I missed uh, this next, part. next month you're doing a follow-up. <laughs> I, I, I was thinking maybe just the <laughs> the demo itself was uh, was was worth a, a, a whole talk. Uh, don't know why why I put so much effort in the slides. <laughs> yeah, Fun. we'll see. We'll see.
Yeah, we'll do yeah, some yeah. Uh, some breakout sessions. Uh, At least surely. people are sharing uh, sharing for uh, a follow up. So uh, we definitely want uh, we'll be in touch with you again. Maybe. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you, Sean. And, uh, yeah. Okay. I'm not sure if it was me, but. Okay. Um, we're a little bit over time, uh, which is uh, normal uh, for our uh, user group meetups. Um, it's uh, now 10 past uh, the hour. I would suggest, uh, whoa, 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 what's happening, what's happening, what's happening? No, no, it's no raffle time. It's no raffle time. Um, so, uh, we have a speaker switch and we will be back in about 15 minutes. Um, I see Alan is uh, eager to uh, get on stage. So uh, let's uh, connect him and uh, we will be with you uh, shortly. So have a drink, have uh, uh, something to eat, uh, stretch your legs and we will be back at uh, 25 past the hour. In the meantime, I made Alan presenter. Um, Alan, if it's okay, you should see red dots underneath a black square. If you start clicking on them, they will turn green and audio and video will appear. Okay. Yeah, the the famous IT crowd uh, comments remains the best solution ever. Okay, Alan is back. I will make him presenter, unlock mic, unlock camera and provide screen sharing. So he should be able to connect. Oh, oh, okay. Good luck, uh, Alan.
So, Alan is back. I see he's enabled for all features. Something is still off. Ellen, is there any way we can help? I sent you a link for a close meeting.
platform tells me it can't access the devices. Is there in the background still a browser connecting to a video stream, audio stream? No. Mm. Okay. Different browser. Yeah, folks. We love technology, we work with it every day, but it's still some uh, some challenges. Especially this is not a regular uh, platform, so. Come on, Kuhn. Of course you love uh, technology. I can elevate you. Unlock, make with enter. Unlock mic. Unlock camera. Provide screen sharing. I really want to figure out why why this is. One one out of seven people have this issue. And they cannot explain it. <laughs> nice, Kenneth. Nice. Uh, Tom, you're you're taking this uh, easy w way. No, no, I'm I'm going to share screen my um, uh, meetup with uh, Alan and then connect that through OBS and then through OBS I go to the media server. Media server goes directly into the the system. Uh, Alan, take your time. No worries. Um, we're making things more difficult by you not using a standard platform. Yeah, Kenneth. Yeah, the only thing is is that uh, it's a little bit late, and I don't think everyone wants to wait until I reach his uh, his location. Yeah, we used to have those, those PHP Linux road trips, especially when we went uh, to uh, um, somewhere middle of uh, the Netherlands. Uh, I can share Zoom or Meet. Um, 
I, uh, let me make a private chat so you can so um Okay. Uh, okay. Um, Alan, just uh, share the link uh, privately, and I will connect to you, and then we'll uh, do a uh, pass through. Okay. Okay. <coughs> yeah, Zoom is launching, so have a little uh, more patience, folks. And I see Alan. So, Alan, let me give you like full view. And I, now I need to make sure that I share my screen. And let me just make this over here so I can follow along. Alan, can you say something to the audience? Yes. Test, test. Let me see. Audio is a... Yeah. Let me bring this closer to the folks. And... Uh, everyone should be able to see me. Um, can you do a screen share of your slides so people can... Yeah, because I cannot share the presentation in, in the Zoom screen, so. Maybe if you can share the screen in Zoom. The slides are visible. And let me see what the audience. Okay, I will turn up the volume and I will be very, very quiet because I don't have a pass through from my uh, loudspeaker to my in. So I haven't set that up yet. Um, let me see if I can do that. Um, people cannot hear him. Um, for inputs. Uh, 
No, I cannot pass through my out. Okay, let me start OBS here. Yeah, yeah. Okay, giving OBS more permissions. Okay. And I can now set uh, sources, audio, and uh, audio input capture. Using microphone, and how can I? Ooh, this is weird. So I have my uh, that's virtual. Can I say something? Okay, and uh, people. Not sure if people hear. Okay, um, everyone should uh, join uh, the Zoom call. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, use a group meetups. Um, I haven't uh, created this look through. I never thought I need needed this, so I uh, never played with it. Um, it would be something uh, to to verify. Let me. Uh, is it okay if I share the the link? I copy a link and I will share this over Zoom. Uh, one notice for all, everyone in the the chat: don't leave because otherwise you will not be able to participate in the raffle. So keep the PHP Benelux uh, meeting open and uh, just mute it and um, and everyone should be muted <laughs> and I will do the same uh, Alan so No. Um, can we hit the record? So maybe we can add this later on onto the YouTube. We definitely need to mute everyone.
change. Sometimes you need to do change that is even unrelated to that package. So the, um, the way the dependencies should work is that you have all the low level stuff should be as stable as possible so that you can just rely on it. And if it doesn't get an update for five years, that's perfectly fine as long as it's stable and tested. And then the higher up you go in your layering, which means the more high level your code goes, um, the uh, more unstable your packages can become. And the most unstable is then the um, the business logic that constantly needs to adapt to business requirements changes and maybe also your uh, presentation layer, for example. It is all very high level. If that changes a lot, it's not a problem because nothing else directly depends on this. Nothing else depends on your presentation layer for your one project. Um, so that's perfectly fine. But the low-level packages, they should be as stable as possible. Um, um, yeah, less releases at lower levels means less changes at higher levels as well. Um, the lower levels, they should be as focused as possible. So the easier and simpler package is, the better for, for stability. And it's easy to just go all in with the testing and make sure that it, it just works reliably. Um, they, um, if, if your packages become too complex, then you need to deal with more and more edge cases and, and interconnection issues and so on and so forth. The stable abstractions principle. Um, the stability exhibited by a package is directly proportional to its level of abstraction. The more abstract a package is, the more stable it tends to be. The more concrete a package is, the more unstable it tends to be. Um, that means that something that is very specific to your client's uh, website, for example, um, that is very concrete. So you're actually solving the problem you're supposed to solve. And that tends to be very unstable because the problem to solve is a moving target. And the abstract packages is things like um, a, um, a collection uh, object. You build it once and then you can just reuse it. Um, my camera is overheating now. It's, it's getting better and better here. So right that, but you can still still see the slides. So that's fine. I'm turning it off right now so that you can cool down. Um, so that means uh, stable packages should also be abstract. You don't want to solve something very specific in a, in a stable package. You want to solve a generic abstract thing. And if you combine this principle with the one before, you actually end up with the dependency inversion principle for packages. Dependencies run in the direction of stability. This means that stability implies abstraction. So that's it for uh, for these theoretical principles. Um, as I said before, you cannot always um, have all of the principles be fulfilled at all times. Some of them are, are uh, flat out uh, contradictory. Um, but you should be aware of what you're actually trying to maximize, what you're trying to optimize for, so that you always have a trend in the right direction when when modeling your packages. So backwards compatibility, that's a big thing uh, if you want to create reusable code, if you want to create uh, reusable packages. Uh, updates without breaking changes increase trust. So um, as long as you can, you should not break the contracts that you put in place with the consumers of your package. That is very important. Because if the consumers of your package don't trust your package, they will use a different one. So if you want to build something that a lot of people are happy to use, make sure that they trust it. Um, and if you stick with backwards compatibility, there's a few observations you will uh, indoubtedly make. First of all, changes turn into additions. You're not just changing a method, you're adding a new method and deprecating the old one, and it, it's still around. So deletions turn into deprecations. Um, you, um, you cannot just remove something because if someone relies on it and they do an update, it will just throw a fatal error. The proper way to do it is to deprecate the stuff that is to be removed. And then maybe you can remove it um, after a few releases if you know that nobody else is using it. Anymore. Then uh, bugs turn into features. Um, that sounds crazy, but the thing is um, that is called 
characterization of code, and you can actually do characterization tests as well, uh, which means that if there is a bug in your code and everyone relies on the behavior of that bug, then it is a feature, and if you fix that bug, you're breaking backwards compatibility, you're breaking other people's projects. So you might actually have bugs that you cannot easily fix. You need to find a strategy to deal with them, to work around them, to have a deprecation strategy in place, because people rely on that behavior. And um, characterization tests, they, they actually test for making sure that the bugs are still in the code, so that uh, instead of having a regression uh, where, where you inadvertently add a new bug, here you actually want to make sure that you don't inadvertently fix the bug because it breaks the expected behavior. Um, that happens a lot, by the, by the way, uh, with code that doesn't have explicit interfaces. So oftentimes explicit interfaces, they, uh, the interface part is cleanly designed or should be cleanly designed and there's not that much potential for bugs. The bugs that I'm talking about is more about having implicit interfaces. So people use something that they get access to because it happened to be not final, it happened to be protected or whatnot. And it was never really tested because it was not part of the official interface, but it was available, so people are using it. And then they rely on, on that behavior, whether it's correct or not. Um, semantic versioning is a very important topic, and I would recommend everyone to just use it. It has um, established itself as just a, a very solid way of dealing with expectations when updates uh, are rolled out. The major version bump means uh, there's breaking changes. The interfaces, the contracts, they are changing. Uh, so everyone knows that if they go from one major to the other, they will need to migrate to that version and make sure the code is adapted. It's just not a clean update. Uh, minor versions are additions or changes, but no breaking changes, and patch versions are just bug fixes. So there's actually no change. It was just uh, like, like a hotfix. Somebody, something need to be fixed. And the effect of cementing version is this. So with backwards compatibility, you keep on accumulating technical debt, which is the lower surface that you can see here. And uh, as long as you stay backwards compatible, there's just no way to get rid of most of that technical debt. It keeps accumulating, it keeps increasing. And whenever you do a major version bump, where you allow for breaking changes, you can seize that opportunity to reuse the technical debt. So people are aware that, okay, this will need a migration, not an update. It will have breaking changes. So I need to look out for what, what needs to do. You might have release notes that explain that. So it's okay then to make these changes that are needed to get the technical debt back down. If you just keep backwards compatible all the time, uh, the technical debt will at one point probably lead to technical bankruptcy. It might be a long way out, but um, technical bankruptcy, meaning that the technical debt has grown so far that you are unable to meet a requirement change that is needed from your code. Um, all right. Um, don't forget the change log. Um, that is what makes people aware of the changes to expect from the code. They can look at the change log before they uh, work on the update. Um, always highlight breaking changes. That's the most important part people are looking for in the change log. And uh, if you want to have bonus points, provide migration guidance. Just let them, people know this interface changed, just add this argument, and then you should be fine, things like that. Um, so that's not that much extra work for you, but can actually save a lot of work for people running the app. Um, then, yeah, naming is hard. Um, be clear and consistent throughout the code. Remember that uh, this is now public open source code. So even all the temporary stuff, the internal stuff, it needs to be properly named because people will look at it. And structure everything in terms of the expected API, meaning that don't think about how to quickly create this in a way that it works. Think about how is this supposed to be used? How is this supposed to be consumed? and then build it so that you actually provide that uh, experience. Um, sometimes uh, making it work and having a proper API is the same thing, but oftentimes it's not. 
so it's important to keep in mind that it's not enough to have something cryptic that happens to work. Uh, you should actually think about the API, how do you interact with that code? Because that is the part that people are using from the package, not the nice language features uh, you make use of. Then finally, make use of uh, relative namespaces where appropriate. Um, you can actually create sub namespaces where it makes sense. You can use the sub namespaces as relative namespaces when reusing things. And that often creates code that is cleaner, more semantic, and, and just uh, better to read. And then, yeah, you want to simplify maintenance. The thing is, if you don't maintain your package, uh, you don't need to release it in the first uh, place. There's no point in releasing something that just then rots away and nobody can use because it's broken and there's no one there to fix it. So uh, always plan for maintenance uh, upfront. If you're not uh, willing to maintain your code, just don't release it. Um, rely on standards as, uh, as good as you can. Uh, so I look at the SPL, look at the PHP fig, um, because that means that it, your code is interoperable, interoperable with a lot of the other code out there. Um, create automated tests for everything. Um, that will be especially important for yourself later down the road when you get uh, a new issue about a bug and somebody creates a pull request and you have no clue how the code works anymore, but your tests will figure out whether the PR is a good one or a bad one. Um, low level packages should be thoroughly tested. As I said, they should be as stable as possible. Um, so make sure that um, when you have something that is, that is uh, that is uh, easy, uh, um, that, that is um, simple in structure, that you go all about with the testing, because you will build up a hierarchy of packages later down the road. And it's great if you have an entire level of packages that you don't need to think about anymore. They just work. Um, use standard file system structure naming. So there's a good starting point in PHP PDS skeleton. Um, PDS is the PHP distribution standard or something like that. Um, and it's, um, it's a repository that shows you how to structure the file system in a nice way. And it was built by just seeing what was out there and what worked. Uh, automate maintenance tasks via CI. Um, you can make your life much easier by automating everything that can be automated at some point so that you can when it comes to maintenance, you can actually focus on the actual code, focus on fixing bugs. Um, this is just one recommendation. I found it uh, pretty interesting. Agapnis slash PHP library template. It has a lot of GitHub action workflows. That is very easy to use. You can just paste them into your repository and you're good to go. Uh, and include contribution guidelines. If you want people to contribute to your code, then make sure you let them know and let them know what the best way is to do so. Yeah, so um, excuse me for rushing through it. We had a lot of technical issues now, um, but hopefully um, you got a lot of value out of it, uh, nevertheless. And I'm open for questions. Yeah, I was muted. Uh, my ah. apologies. Um, was pressing the wrong buttons. Um, <laughs> let me check on the click meeting because uh, I saw a lot of questions also over here. Um, um, how often do you think it's one to break it backwards compatibility is one of the questions yeah and that's a very good question a very hard one to to answer to um on one hand it, it depends really on what your package is doing there are packages that just require constant updates 
because they need to keep in sync with something. So it's unavoidable to constantly make changes. And if you're constantly making changes, you tend to have more breaking changes that are required than if you have a very stable package. Um, but it's also um, hard to uh, hard to respond because there's also a political component. Um, there's on one hand, you have a lot of people that say you should have as many breaking changes as possible in terms of bumping the PHP minimum version that forces everyone to get to up-to-date versions of PHP, which increases the security of the web. And uh, there's other people that say, yeah, but there's, uh, the web consists of mostly legacy projects. And if you're going too fast, you're just leaving those in the dust. And that makes the web more insecure because they don't get updates anymore. Um, so um, yeah, there's no real good answer to that. Uh, it's something, the, the political point is something every maintainer has to decide for themselves, for themselves, and then look at what the package actually requires in terms of breaking changes. Oftentimes, you can um, you can postpone breaking changes and group them in one major release, um, so that um, in, instead of having one every month, you have um, you have a, a longer period where not having any breaking changes and then they all come together, sometimes that is doable. But it, it's really, there's no, no real answer to that. It, it depends on so much, and it also depends on your own ideologies. Um, uh, no questions here. I'm looking at the uh, chat also in... Um, in the click meeting. Um, you start creating open source packages uh, by starting with your customer needs, but how do you deal with it financially afterwards? Yeah, that's also a good question. Um, I, I think that most developers have a general approach to things. And Creating reusable packages means that you can slowly work towards your own preferred starting point with new projects. And that means that uh, the reusable packages you create, you are one of the reusers for every subsequent project you're doing. So in, in this regard, you're not only being paid to create packages, but you're also being paid by the same customer or by, the, by future customers uh, to maintain the packages because they're constantly being reused in new projects. And so um, it, it just, it's financed by being the code you use to build client projects. Then. Okay. Um, it uh, looks like those are the questions. I'm double checking here. Yes. And other one popping up. Um, uh, when working on packages that have a lot of dependencies and configurations, is there a way to test it in a running project while working on it? Yeah, that's called co cowboy coding. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm not sure I'm, I'm correctly understanding the question. Um, uh, yeah, so uh, there's a lot of dependencies, configurations. Uh, so if you have the, 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 the package uh, part of a project uh, and you also work on the package, uh, how, is there a way to test any backwards compatibility breaks and those kind of things? Um, yeah, I, I think that has a lot to do with, with testing. So testing should always be a pyramid. We have lots and lots of unit tests uh, at the base of the pyramid. Unit tests are cheap and fast. And then the higher you go, you have less tests of the higher level. Uh, you have full integration tests, uh, full end-to-end -end tests at the top of the pyramid. You don't have a lot of them because they are very expensive to run, very slow. Um, but um, you basically want to have each layer of the pyramid uh, be touched. And that pyramid does not only work within one package; it also works about uh, also works 
in the context of an entire project where all the dependencies are, are being considered. Uh, so what I normally do is if there's lots of interdependencies, each package should be testable in isolation for all of its internal qualities. So unit testing, behavior testing, that should happen within the package and you should, you should be able to always run that without pulling the package into some, uh, some bigger system. And then um, the, um, the overarching project where you pull everything together, that should have tests that make sure that they test every single subsystem, every single place where there are dependencies, so that you make sure that the dependencies were pulled in correctly, that they work as expected and so on. But that's usually not unit testing, that's integration testing or end-to-end -end testing. Um, so um, this is really, um, th this is um, a general approach for, for, the, for a testing strategy to have that kind of pyramid and you can split that up across the project and its packages that make it up. Okay. Um. Uh, uh, final question, can you share your slides? Yes. You, you um, shared it already with me. Um, no, I think there was the wrong link. Let me fetch the other one. Yeah, the, the, the slides are on your GitHub accounts, I see. Um, I have the link here, so okay. I will uh, also uh, send it uh, using the Meetup. Um, um, newsletter so everyone uh, receives it. Yeah, m make sure you use the correct one. The one I sent you earlier was, um, uh, oh, the was old pointing one? to the repo, not the slides. Okay, uh, let me get these and I will put it in my notes. Okay. Um, no, I'm now I have lost my yeah this is not it it should be too many windows <laughs> uh, okay um yeah it was a bit chaotic now uh yeah thanks everyone for being flexible by the way well at least uh um you got me puzzled now because I really want to figure out what what that issue is that you have with uh, connecting with uh, click to meeting um, yeah I, I tried with Chrome and with edge yeah uh, and it it showed the permission prompt allowed it it saw the devices but when I tried to use the device it, it always gave me an error message that it cannot use the device because it might already be in use um, but with zoom with me everything it just worked yeah. Um, and uh, it was not only the camera, it was both the camera and the microphone. Sometimes yeah. I already had that issue with the camera, but then the microphone worked, but here yeah. both just didn't work. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Windows 10, Windows 7, Windows 11? <laughs> Actually, Windows 11. I inadvertently uploaded <laughs> to Windows 11 very early alpha, which is not really recommended. Okay. Then uh, I should run the test on Windows 11 as well. <laughs> yeah, maybe that's that's part of the issue. I don't know, but um, yeah, in in all the other programs, it, it still seems to work. So okay, might be related with Windows Eleven, but it might also be completely unrelated. All right, uh, thank you, Alan. Thank you for uh, uh, yeah keeping your cool uh, while uh, going through this uh, ordeal. Um, it was also a fun experiment for me to learn about how to connect, reconnect uh, the, the, the streams. Um, what I will do now is I will uh, switch over to click to meeting um, and uh, continue from there. So uh, everyone that's uh, here can now join me back in uh, the click meeting and uh, I will uh, present from there uh, because there is a very important uh, part of the, the meetup uh, going on right now, um, which uh, everyone should be uh, yeah, very enthusiastic about. So um, I will see you there as well, Alan? Yes, Okay. Uh, in chat only. In chat only. All right. 
Good. Uh, I will close the Zoom and uh, I will uh, see you there. See you. the stream again um, so the stream is there <coughs> and I should be able um, to ensure right now go back to the presentation um, so we already had Alan here um, so again, Alan, uh, thank you very much for the debating. Um, this was a very interesting uh, uh, session. Unfortunately, I got only bits and pieces out of it uh, because I was trying to get everything working in the background. But uh, yeah, uh, uh, good advice. And uh, um, I'm also getting notification about echo on the audio so let me fix this as well uh, and where's my click meeting here just give me a second to get the audio back the echo is gone uh, So now audio should be okay and video should be okay. Um, okay. Um, I think it's time for, for, for the, uh, uh, the next part. Um, yeah, we haven't set up a joined in yet. I will send a link for joined in uh, 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 once we have it uh, set up again. And uh, uh, after this session, we also have a uh, open discussion session, uh, open spaces. Feel free to join where we can have the conversation going. And I think it's uh, time for raffle. <laughs> Where's my raffle screen? Okay. Can I uh, share my screen? There you go. Allow. And I should be able to. Wait, wait, wait. Why am I not able to? Okay, then I will just drag this in. There you go. <coughs> Let me grab this one over here. And now I have a full screen I can use. Um, okay, so time to go and raffle. Um, I think I forgot Alan because he was a presenter. Let me just add him. <laughs> okay, um, time to uh, spin the wheel. This is for the PHP elephant. The blue one. Michael Lawrence. Or Michel Laurent. Michel Laurent. Okay, you get the blue one. Next up, the pink elephant. Tenets, you got a pink one.
Next up is the Infinity one. <laughs> Justin. This one just got in and it's already yours. Final elephant to raffle. Another <laughs> infinity one for Kun. Congratulations to all. I will make sure that we get uh, you uh, the details, how to uh, get your uh, shipping addresses uh, to us and uh, the elephants will be shipped. So that said, next up is <coughs> the next meetup is the second uh, thursday of the month and for august that would be uh august oh, that's um, july august the 12th so if you have no holiday plans, then um, we will uh, love to see you uh, back uh, August 12th. And uh, if you're interested in speaking, uh, send an email to meetup at phpbundlex.eu. Um, and hope to see you all next time. For those who want to stick around, we have an open discussion session. So let's have... Uh, some PHP talks and uh, talk some more. Um, I will open up the breakout rooms and we will get started. All right, uh, Gabriel, good uh, fortune. Have a good holiday and uh, see you all in the, in the field.